Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Dr. Jill Live. I'm here with my friend and colleague, Dr. Dale Bredesen. And if you have not heard of Dr. Bredesen, you are missing out. But today, I promise you there's going to be some exciting updates and things and everything to do with Alzheimer's disease, preventing and reversing Alzheimer's disease, and with cognition. So let me give you a brief um, welcome, Dr. Bredesen. Thank you for coming on today. Thank you so much, Jill. Always great to talk to you. You too. So Dr. Bredesen is an Alzheimer's and neurodegenerative disease researcher and the foremost authority on reversal of cognitive decline for those experiencing Alzheimer's symptoms. Having spent his career on the forefront of research into the mechanisms of neurodegenerative disease, Dr. Dale Bredesen and his team at the Bredesen Lab have discovered effective therapeutics for Alzheimer's disease. And yes, you've heard me right. Often we think of, you know, recovering from cancer and recovering from autoimmunity, but rarely have you maybe heard how people can achieve recovery or um, improvement with Alzheimer's. And today we're going to dive into that. These discoveries from Dr. Bredesen have led to the publication of over 200 research papers, as well as the development of the Bredesen Protocol, a multi-step approach designed to reverse the effects of subjective cognitive impairment, mild cognitive impairment, and early Alzheimer's disease. The protocol is offered through two programs, sorry, two programs, the pre-code for prevention and the recode for reversal. Dr. Bredesen is also the author of two New York Times bestsellers, The End of Alzheimer's, the first program to prevent and reverse cognitive decline, and The End of Alzheimer's program. Again, welcome, Dr. Bredesen. It is so exciting to talk to you. And uh, you've got some new stuff we're going to talk about at the end of ways to not only achieve a wellness and reversal of Alzheimer's, but some really practical tools your team has been working on to help patients achieve even more. I'm super excited about that. Um, for those who don't know you, give us just a little backstory on how did you get into this research and uh, where did this all start? Yeah, you know, so I came through a very, very classical sort of training way back in the 1970s and 80s uh, through Caltech and MIT and, and actually spent some time at Harvard on the neurology service there uh, and then UCSF and ultimately becoming a professor at UCLA. And the idea was, you know, I, as we came through this, I realized there's nothing you can do about these neurodegenerative diseases. If you have ALS, you're going to die. If you have frontotemporal dementia, you're going to die. You know, you can just go right down the list. It's the area of greatest biomedical therapeutic failure. So I thought at the time, okay, I need to go into the lab and start looking at what actually drives these processes. And so we spent 30 years, as you said, we've published over 200 papers uh, on what actually drives the problem. And the interesting thing is it went against what I had been taught. I had been taught that this was about misfolded proteins and it's about prions and it's about reactive oxygen species. And what it turned out is actually much closer to my, what my wife, who is an integrative physician had told me, she said, you know, whatever you guys find, it's gonna be have something to do with sleeping and eating and kind of the basics of life. And I said, no, 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 we're gonna find one molecule with one fold. We're gonna get a drug that goes against that fold. And everything's gonna be great. It didn't turn out to work that way. So what we found interestingly is that Alzheimer's disease is a network insufficiency. You have this beautiful network, these amazing, you know, about 500 trillion synapses in your brain and you have a supply and a demand, and you have all sorts of, you need trophic support, and you need um, blood flow, and you need oxygenation, and you need glucose and ketones and metabolic flexibility and all these things. And of course, as you have really pointed out with such an expert uh, uh, approach, toxins you're exposed to, things like biotoxins, these things are absolutely crucial. So we realized, that, okay, there's this network and you have to identify the areas of the network that are failing, and then you have to address those. And you want to address the things that are actually causing the problem. Sure, downstream, it's fine if you need a drug mm -hmm. to change the processing of APP, for example, fine. But the idea of using that as a monotherapy simply has not worked. And you know, Jill, one of the most interesting and telling things that's come out is the downstream look. So people who went on Aricept or Nemenda did worse in the long run than going on nothing. The people who went on the anti-amyloid antibodies 
like lecanemab and things like that, have more rapid brain atrophy than people who don't. So these things are short-term, not very good solutions with lots of side effects and huge cost that lead to worse outcomes in the long run. But when you actually go upstream and you look at the various things and you fix the network, these people do, and I'm actually writing a paper now on people who uh, got improvements that were over five years. We have people 10 and 11 years wow. who have kept their improvement all that time. Something that's unheard of yeah. with typical pharmaceutical treatments. Oh, so I love how you describe that because, you know, we all go into medicine and we love the idea of a blockbuster drug that could save the lives of hundreds of thousands of people. But the truth is, it's a lot more complex than that. And you just did a brilliant uh, job of describing, like you originally uh, put out the research and you talked about the holes in the roof, right? There's 30 That's plus right. more. And the difficulty right. is it's not just a one drug, one solution. And right. unfortunately, it's a lot of hard work, <laughs> but you've put together a lot of the program to assist and help people. So what can, if someone's at home and they're, you know, 50 in their fifties, which is very early for onset, but we're seeing more and more people, younger people, how could they start? What would you recommend? I know you have something called the, um, Cognos screen is a Cognoscope, right? Cognoscope. Cognoscopy. Thank Cognoscopy. You. So we're just saying, you know, just like colonoscopy, mm -hmm. Um, you should have a cognoscopy if you're 40 or over, and we should all do that. Um, but you brought up something really important here. You know, when I was training, we thought of Alzheimer's as a disease of your 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. It's turned out to be a disease of your 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s that just gets diagnosed 20 to 30 years later. And so these changes are actually happening quite early on. And that what people can do, start by recognizing this is actually, as you said, it's complex, but it boils down to two simple things. Number one is energetics. Do you have enough? Are you getting enough blood flow, oxygenation, mitochondrial function, ketones, glucose, those things? And the second one is ongoing inflammation. Do you have a change in your oral microbiome? Do you have exposure to mycotoxins, as you pointed out? All these things, these are the two big things. And so actually there is a lot you can do. And you said something really important. We're seeing people younger and younger. That's been published by epidemiologists. The biggest increases are in people in their 40s and 50s. And when I was training, I've asked a few of my neurological colleagues, did we ever see way back in the 1980s when I was training as a neurologist, did we ever see people in their 50s with Alzheimer's? And the answer was no, we never saw that. One of the most common things that I hear about now, 52 year old woman who is, and it's more females because it seems um, of this osteoclastic surge or burst that you go through. It's really been tough because the, the toxins, as you know, that you're exposed to seem to take a bump at the time when there's this beginning of this osteoclastic burst. So you have that mercury exposure that wasn't so bad when you were sequestering it. And now it does happen in andropause as well, but it seems to be more common with, with perimenopause and menopause. So I think what people can do today get a cognoscopy, check out, see where you stand and start doing some of the basics. And we think of, as you know, seven basics, diet, exercise, sleep, stress, brain training, some detox and some uh, targeted supplements. Those are the basics. And I think in, a long, in the long run, what we will hopefully have is a public health program where everybody does some basics and then the people who fall through the cracks who, have, who, who actually get past that, okay, they will then have a more extensive evaluation, more extensive treatment. And then a few of those people will still go through. They'll have to have a still more extensive. As you know, some of these people can be very, very difficult to reverse. And yet you see it again and again, when you do the right things, you see people get better. And most importantly, you see them stay better. Yes. And I loved, um, we talked about in the beginning here, the subjective cognitive impairment, which could happen as early as late thirties, um, yes. and the mild cognitive impairment. And, uh, then the, uh, early Alzheimer's disease. I also noticed you're, you're really framing this. If, if we have someone with very severe or moderate Alzheimer's, it's at least in my experience, and I'm assuming with yours, it's a lot harder to treat and reverse those patients, right? So we're actually wanting people to say, where am I at? Even if I'm in my late thirties or early forties, 
Um, so describe briefly for those listening who maybe don't know what those categories are, what that looks like, the subjective, cognitive, the mild, and the early. And then let's yeah. talk about what people can do if they're just a little concerned or they have a family history. Where can people start? And this is a great point. And it's, and it's a common uh, also misconception that, you know, this is all Alzheimer's. But as of course, Alzheimer's is just a pathology. But as you say, you end up with a dementia. So there you go through four phases when you develop Alzheimer related dementia. Phase one, you are asymptomatic. So you go through some period and you can already show sometimes in your 20s and 30s even, you can begin to show changes in PET scans and changes in uh, spinal fluid. Now, who, who wants a spinal tap every year? I don't. Yeah. So the good news is there is a big breakthrough now with blood testing. So you can now get phosphotal 181, which we should all, if you know, if you know your blood pressure and your cholesterol, you yeah. should find out your phosphotal 181 and your 42 to 40 ratio of A beta. Soon we will also have GFAP. It's a research tool still, but that'll be, that's even more sensitive, although it's less specific. If your GFAP is normal, you're in pretty good shape because you're not heading for Alzheimer's, at least at that point. So you go through a period that's asymptomatic. That's phase one. Phase two is what you mentioned, SCI, subjective cognitive impairment. By definition, that means you know there's something not quite right. You're not remembering phone numbers the way you used to. You may have struggles at work, that sort of thing. Um, but you're still able to score within the normal range on cognitive tests. Now, it may be that you're just really smart, and so you've lost a lot, but you're still able to score in the normal range, but that is SCI. Now, the good news, SCI is completely reversible. We see virtually 100% of those people reverse to normal when they do the right things, and it lasts on average 10 years. So you have this clear period. Now, the problem is your doctor tells you, oh, it's just normal aging. Right. Please don't listen to your doctor about that because this is not normal aging. You should not be having this SCI. And at the end of the 10 years, what happens is it tends to convert to MCI, which is it's too bad that it was named mild cognitive impairment. It's like telling someone, don't worry, you only have mildly metastatic cancer. It's a relatively late stage of cognitive decline. And that lasts for typically several years, three to five years. Each year that you have that, there is a five to 10% chance you'll convert to full-on dementia. During that time, what it means is you're now not doing well on the cognitive tests, but you're still able to do your activities of daily living. When you begin to lose those, then by definition, you've developed dementia. And that typically occurs right around a MOCA score of 19 to 22, right in there. So we'd like to catch people when they're up, and best would be when they're up 28, 29, still doing very well on their MOCAs, but they just know they have that SCI, then they do absolutely great. Now, the good news, we've had people with MOCA scores of zero, which is end-stage dementia, where they will improve, but they, they don't improve to 30, they, which is perfect. They improve to five or nine or that sort of thing. So my hope is that we can ultimately understand enough about this disease. We can take people from zero to 30. As far as I'm aware, no one has ever done that, but that's what we need to understand better. It may take the sorts of intranasal peptides you've yeah. talked about in the past. It may take stem cells. It may take other things. But somehow we need to understand that. But it's a little bit like at that point, having a collapsed building and say, how can we take this now and make it a, a perfect building again? We have to figure out how to reconnect those synapses. So those are the four phases you go through. Got it. And uh, testing this out. So where would someone start? Is there, do you offer uh, a MOCA online or where would people start to get tested if they're like, or would they ask their doctor for a RICO? Tell us a little bit about, say someone's out there listening, like, oh, my, my mother or myself, or I'm having some issues. I'd like to get screened. Where would they go? Such a great point. And yeah, you can just go mycognoscopy.com and you can actually get blood tests um, very easily. Um, you can actually, uh, you can get a an online cognitive assessment uh, very easy. And, and actually the online cognitive assessments are even more sensitive than MOCA. Mm -hmm. So MOCA, MOCA was developed for MCI, but it wasn't developed for SCI. So it's not very good in that SCI range. Whereas online assessments like uh, CQ test and like the uh, CNS vital signs and some people like others like Cambridge, for example, there are other ways to go. 
Uh, brain check, I think, is another one. Um, these are more sensitive than MOCA, so they can pick up that SCI phase, which is really nice so that you can get things going. And people are often, as you know, people are shocked. Yes. Uh, we had one person, for example, who came in even with the MOCA who said, you know, this is in my family. I think I'm okay, but I better get checked. And her, her MOCA was 23, which is fairly late stage MCI. I'm like, wow. And yeah. she's done beautifully. Her MOCA is now 30. She did absolutely great doing the right thing. So there is a lot you can do by getting started. And the earlier you start, the better uh, better off you do, as you know. And also, you know, finding the things that you actually have to address. It's very different, as you well know. Some people, you know, mycotoxins are critical. Other people, it's metabolic syndrome. Yeah. Other people, it's a leaky gut. You know, other people, it's change in their oral microbiome. It's remarkable how different the contributors are. Yeah. And I hey, everybody. I just stopped by to let you know that my new book, Unexpected, Finding Resilience Through Functional Medicine, Science, and Faith is now available for order wherever you purchase books. In this book, I share my own journey of overcoming life-threatening illness and the tools and tips and tricks and hope and resilience I found along the way. This book includes practical advice for things like cancer and Crohn's disease and other autoimmune conditions, infections like Lyme or Epstein-Barr and mold and biotoxin-related illness. What I really hope is that as you read this book, you find transformational wisdom for health and healing. If you want to get your own copy, stop by readunexpected.com. There you can also collect your free bonuses. So grab your copy today and begin your own transformational journey through functional medicine in finding resilience. Contributors are. Yeah, and I love this is really at the core of personalized medicine, which is uh, what we all strive to do and what medicine really should. There's nothing unusual about this. It's kind of how we why we all went into medicine and research to become healers and really understand. But we kind of get the idea in at least conventional allopathic medicine. There's one diagnosis and one uh, blockbuster drug like we started in the beginning. And it's just not that way. So it's way more complex. But when we get to those root causes that are personalized, we see the really miraculous kind of recoveries that should happen in all kinds of uh, facets of not just Alzheimer's and early cognition issues, but other diseases as well. Let's briefly jump to the mold topic, because as you know, that's near and dear to my heart. Um, right. I've seen people again in their 30s, 40s with very significant cognitive impairment because of mold. I think one time you said that the early onset dementias, um, you saw around one in three that could be related to biotoxin environment. Where would you say now, would you still agree with that statistic or how often is mold a contributing factor to cognitive impairment? Yeah. And when we were first saying, you know, somewhere around one in three or so, we were thinking the ones where it's the predominant thing, yeah, got it. as far as being a contributor, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I asked the, the clinicians that, that I'm working with on the trial, we have six absolutely fantastic clinicians. I think, you know, all of them, you know, mm -hmm. Nate Bergman and Craig Tanio and, and, uh, and um, David Haas. And, uh, you know, and, and Christine Burke and Anne Hathaway and, and Kat Toops. I'm thrilled to be working with all of them. They're absolutely fantastic. They tell me in their practices, more like 70 to 80 percent have at least some contribution from toxicity. And it's usually mycotoxins, it's usually these biotoxins. That's scary. Yeah. Uh, they're just, this is such a common problem. And of course, it's really tough. And as you know better than anyone, You've got the spouse saying, well, how come I'm doing so well then? Um, and then you say, well, what about the kids? Well, one's got ADHD and the other one's got a pulmonary problem. And the yep. third one's got this, a rash. And yeah. it's like, well, wait a minute. You see the pattern here exactly. that you are being exposed to things. So it is, it is very tough because this is not even recognized yet. The Alzheimer's Association does not recognize mycotoxins as a cause of Alzheimer's. And yet it's one of the most common contributors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's usually insidious because if you just ask, I always uh, say, if I ask patients right flat out, do you have mold in your home? 99% will say no, because it's hidden right. behind a wall or floorboard. And it really is an ordeal to figure out what's going on and remediate or fix the problem. Uh, because often it's uh, it's hidden, it can be expensive. Yes. So it's hard to get people to go there. But um, once we test and find out that that is an issue I've like you seen. Now I tend to work with the younger, you know, autoimmune, yeah. environmentally toxic, um, but cognition is a key component. I think when we look at mycotoxin studies, the number one physical complaint is 
impaired memory or cognition. So it fits along with that. And again, this could be someone in their twenties or thirties that doesn't have early onset dementia, but the cognition is really impaired and even mood and sleep and all of these things that go together. Um, sleep. Let's talk really briefly about sleep because I think this is an under, um, uh, talked about topic related to the brain. How important is sleep? Um, how does that affect cognition? And where do you start with someone who's having impairment and maybe not sleeping well? Yeah. And just, just to add to what you just said, because I think it's such an important point that there is this phenomenon of younger people having mm -hmm. this. So the typical ones we see with inflammation, it's more like in their sixties, the atrophic ones we see who just don't have the hormonal and nutrient support. They're typically in their seventies, mm -hmm. but the ones who come in with the biotoxins are typically in their forties and fifties. And they do look different. When I first realized this, yeah. uh, you know, I was way behind you on this realizing, wait a minute, hey, there's something going on here. It was because there was a group of people who didn't respond to our original approach of let's optimize their hormones and let's optimize their nutrients and let's decrease their inflammation. There was this other group. And you're right, they are younger. Um, they are, and this is, by the way, you know, as I mentioned, the epidemiologists are telling us that's what's on the rise, the 40-somethings and 50-somethings, hugely on the rise. They're younger and they look different. They less often have pure memory problems. It's more about executive functions. Yes. So I think of non-amnestic uh, pre presentations versus am amnestic is classical Alzheimer's. But then there's this non-amnestic, which is very much what you're dealing with often. Now, yes, some of them have memory problems for sure, especially the ApoE4s. But often you'll see ApoE4 negative mm -hmm. who's having trouble at work. They just can't figure out that new iPhone and they just can't get things together. They can't calculate. They can't make tips. They can't write grants. They can't do all the things that they were doing before. They often have trouble um, with vision. I was going to ask you about posterior cortical atrophy and primary progressive aphasia, two of the classic presentations of Alzheimer's that are non-amnestic. And the piece, and they're both turning out to be toxin-related problems. And actually, I was just talking yesterday to uh, to Carrie Mills Rutland, who is a health coach who's doing a great job up in New York City, and seeing some of these people who have posterior cortical atrophy prevent, presenting with these visual changes, going to ophthalmologists and saying, "No, no, this is not an eye problem. This is a brain problem." And it's interesting, they are turning out to be people who have some toxicity. So we're trying to understand what drives you to have that presentation of Alzheimer's as opposed to a different presentation of Alzheimer's. And, and they often have depression, as you know. They often have HPA axis dysfunction. They often are exquisitely sensitive to stress. They go on an all-night flight and they're a mess. Um, they often respond quite well to BHRT, for example. So they really look like a different group. Now, my big worry is we've got all these people who've had COVID. They're all the setup for 10, 15, 20 years down the road of having these same sorts of cognitive problems. So I think that that is an important thing for people to recognize and to get them on uh, optimal treatment, just as you do in your practice. So you mentioned sleep. So but anyway, uh, let me let you respond to that because I think that this is a such an important and under-recognized area. No, actually, and I want to go on a tangent. We'll come back to sleep in a moment because this is so critical yeah. what you've just said um, because I know listeners out there are going, yeah, I don't feel like I'm quite myself. And especially I love that you mentioned COVID because what we're seeing is vascular issues are so yeah. prominently um, if people had multiple episodes of COVID, even one yeah. episode, but it, I see so many things related to hypercoagulability, blood viscosity, and even looking at, and this is absolutely important for the brain, no matter what your age, because probably the number one thing for proper brain function is blood flow to the brain, right? Yeah. So I love that you mentioned that because I think people are post COVID having these long COVID kinds of symptoms. And a huge proportion of that is this fuzzy term called brain fog, which is just, they yeah. can't do what they used to be able to do. Like you said, they maybe can't executive function. Would that be the bucket you'd put it into as far as how to describe the impairment as far as planning and organizing and doing yeah. tasks and or understanding. And again, you organizing. Involved. Yeah, exactly right. And you brought up a really important point, which is this change in coagulability. And my colleague and, and co-author, 
uh, Dr. Alexei Karakin, with whom I've worked for many years, pointed out something very interesting, that when you look at where does amyloid come from, it is part of the innate immune system. We understand that. But his, his point was, it's really part of the innate immune system's memory. So once you've been exposed to something, you have a heightened response. You're, and, and that's basically what Alzheimer's is, this heightened response. That's why ApoE4, heightened response to these various uh, pathogens and, and insults. Well, what happens is the amyloid is part of a response which lives as the memory in three locations. It lives in your bone marrow, it lives in your endothelial cells, and it lives in your tissue macrophages, which are, core, of course, the microglia in the brain. So because it lives in the endothelial cells, you lose the ability for this normal laminar flow and this nice uh, flow where you're not having microthrombi. You get COVID or you're now heading for Alzheimer's. You've now changed your, your innate memory and you're now in a hypercoagulable state. And so just as you said, with COVID, you see these multiple microthrombi, which is why a lot of people like to treat it with natokinase. Mm -hmm. And so you wanna get rid of that. And we've had a number of people in the clinical trials where the big problem was hypercoagulability. Yes. And so this is, I think, a huge and under-recognized area, both for long COVID and for Alzheimer's and, you know, and various steps along the way, SCI and MCI, on the way to dementia. These are huge and important issues that should be addressed therapeutically. You just described it so eloquently because at the core, it's endothelial dysfunction and damage. And interesting because we've known for years that nitric oxide is produced on the endothelium, which is a vasodilator. Yeah. And when you mentioned women, all of a sudden in this postmenopause or perimenopause time frame that really shifts, that's one of the things. I think it's at age of 40, we have 50% production of nitric oxide of that when we were young. And then at 60, it's 15% production. And this is all an endothelial derived thing that opens up blood vessels and gets blood flow. So not only we have our age instigating decrease in nitric oxide production, but then we have things like viruses, like COVID was a big one, but other infections that cause endothelial inflammation and damage. And I love that you're thinking along that lines, because like I said, I probably the biggest thing that I'm seeing now on all realms in all ages is if you had COVID, what that's doing to blood flow, blood viscosity, endothelial lining. Um, you mentioned natokinase, lumbrokinase is amazing. Um, are you using pycnogenol as part of the main protocol for yes, well? Yes, well. Yeah. And what about nitric oxide precursors? Uh, Absolutely. Yep. yep. Yeah, so all the do you have a favorite one for nitric oxide precursors? Um, uh, let's see, Neo40 and Berkeley Life. I really love Berkeley Life lately. It's the ones I've been using. Yeah. Fantastic. Then, yeah, yeah. We could, we've been using uh, Neo40 in the past. That's a great point. Yeah. Um, and interestingly, this is a little point, you probably knew this, but it was fascinating when I found out um, we convert the nitrates in our food, like beets and turnips and leafy greens into and, and our microbes in our mouth. So when you use those really heavy duty mouthwashes, you're actually decreasing your ability to produce nitric oxide in the body. I didn't know that. So I've been telling people, don't use mouthwash <laughs> if you want that good nitric oxide. Which is it's a great point. And it's also why we like things like checking your oral DNA, yes. seeing what your oral microbiome is doing, and then using things like dental sidin mm -hmm. uh, and oral probiotics to yeah. optimize. I, I do think, you know, optimizing your oral microbiome, very important. Yes, because it's so close. And even sinuses, when we get mold inhalation, as you know, you can probably describe them far more eloquently than me, but it's so close with that. And we used to think there was no permeability there, right? But as we have infections and issues in our sinuses, in our mouth, it's so close that we do have some transfer across the blood-brain barrier. Um, any thoughts on that real quickly before we move to sleep with uh, like sinuses, if there's an issue, mouth, if there's an issue, why is that important to the brain? It's such a good point. You know, it's it's been interesting to me that you look at Alzheimer's, it is largely a face-related brain problem. So as you said, it's your sinuses and it is your, your lips, your herpes simplex here, your change in your oral microbiome, your chronic sinusitis, even HHV6A probably coming in through your sinuses. Um, we had a person recently with a big fungus ball in his sinuses uh, that had been there and, and been missed for a couple of years. So yes, I agree with you. Now, there's a great, one of the most, uh, most interesting experiments I read in the last couple of years was where the group was looking to say, okay, we all know about the blood-brain barrier. It's supposed to exclude all these things. We're going to put candida into the bloodstream and see how many weeks the blood-brain barrier could exclude it. The answer was a couple of minutes. That's it. Mm -hmm. So when you have candida in your bloodstream, it gains access to your brain within minutes. Mm -hmm. 
And so whatever this blood brain barrier is, yeah, great for holding out certain chemicals. But in fact, there's a lot of there are a lot of things that seem to be able to get across there. And of course, we find what you know, what do the neuropathologists tell us? P. gingivalis, T. denticola, P. intermediate, they're all in your brain. These yeah. things are there. And of course, there's a more and more interest in these things being causing you know, atherosclerosis and causing distal cancers and things like that. So I think that this idea that you've got a microbiome and it's kind of right uh, stuck in that area. That is going. You know, we've got what I think of as the medical. I'm thinking more and more of this is like the medical internet. The internet, you know, developed by DARPA back in the 60s, you know, allowed us all this communication. Well, now we're realizing that the, that there's a medical internet. You've got things connecting between your, you know, your brain and your in your gut and your mouth and your sinuses and all all over the body. You've got this amazing flow, and um, you know that 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 can be bad or that can be good. So important. And I love that we talked about sinuses, mouth, all the importance. Let's go back to sleep, um, of the importance of sleep. And if people aren't sleeping, first of all, is that the chicken or the egg is part of Alzheimer's impairment in sleep and circadian rhythm, or is it that impairment and lack of proper sleep is leading to cognitive dysfunction? Such a good point. You know, and this is where so much of biology, I think, wants to have things be linear and simple. Uh, I remember years ago, two experts were fighting about whether it was bad for your brain to have too much cortisol or too little cortisol. Well, of course, both. Right. You know, yeah. There's a sweet spot for all these things. And so it's the same way with these things where, you know, poor sleep begets more Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. Alzheimer's begets more poor sleep. So unfortunately, these are feedbacks that are unfortunately positive. I think of these as prionic loops where something begets more of itself. And unfortunately, the, you see that again and again and again. And it's really the nature of the signaling pathways in your brain, because we think a lot about homeostasis. But what we forget is when you have a multi-goal outcome, as with blood clotting or as with learning, you're trying to go from one part to another. So you're, you're basically having a molecular switch. Oh, OK, make this synapse stronger right now quickly or make a blood clot because you're going to die if you don't do that. So what you have is a feed forward. And unfortunately, just as you were indicating, you know, the same thing happens. It's not really a chicken and egg. It's kind of both. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, you're right. Um, Alzheimer's does interfere with sleep. And on the other hand, poor sleep enhances your risk for Alzheimer's disease. And there's more and more on this. And I worry a lot about the people who have low SpO2. There was an interesting paper a few years ago where they showed that if you just look at the mean SpO2 for the night, it correlates very nicely with the size of your hippocampus and other nuclei within your brain. So if you're sleeping and you're, you know, your average uh, uh, SpO2 is down, you know, 89 or 90, instead of where it should be, you know, 96 or 97, you are hurting yourself. That's you're not giving yourself the best chance. So absolutely, you got to make sure the person doesn't have upper airway resistance syndrome and you're know, pouring out the adrenaline. You want to make sure they don't have sleep apnea. So common and unfortunately mm -hmm. so underdiagnosed and so treatable. Yeah. So let me be clear. If workup for sleep apnea is part of the cognition assessment. Um, my other thought is, um, as we uh, try to treat this, a lot of the treatments like hypnotics or um, antihistamines uh, have an effect on cognition. So if yeah. you were to give someone something to help them sleep, would you go with more natural first? Where would you go with that? And what would you say to avoid if you are experiencing cognitive impairment? Yes, this is a really good point. And there are all, all sorts of things that can, be, can can exacerbate this. So yes, you want to avoid things that change your sleep pattern. You absolutely want to avoid antihistamines if you can. You want to avoid anticholinergics. You want to avoid, just as you said, the sedatives. You want to avoid the, the various benzodiazepines. These are all things that increase, very clearly increase your risk for cognitive decline. So what you want to do is look at what's holding it back. Uh, by the way, a lot, as you well know, a lot of times it's low progesterone. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the progesterone is helpful for your parasympathetic system system and helps you sleep. So having, if you, if possible, having a normal level of progesterone, very helpful. Melatonin, and just as with nitric oxide, the melatonin is declining as we get a little older. It is a normal product. So having, and you don't want to take tons of it, but uh, having small amounts of melatonin 
um, you know, half a milligram, one milligram, typical, some people like three milligrams, but you know, that kind of general order. And I recognize some people use 100 milligrams for other reasons. It does have anti-tumor effects. It does have anti-COVID effects and things like that. That's something separate. But for sleep, you know, small amounts, um, things like L-theanine, uh, you know, relaxing. Um, you know, we just saw last few days people talking about lavender sheets and these various uh, inhalants that actually improve normal cognition, which is great. And that's one of my arguments. What we do for preventing Alzheimer's also enhances normal cognition. So there's no need to wait until you're having problems. You're going to improve your normal cognition as well. Um, so there are so many ways to go after this. Um, just good sleep hygiene. And I, I know I am guilty of this myself, working on emails late at night, uh, working on you know, writing something, and then boom, it's time to go to bed. Like, no, that's not a good way to do it. You want to have some good, you know, get your blue blockers on. You want to kind of fade. So I'd be interested in your approach. How do you get people to kind of fade into sleep so that they get an optimal sleep? Because I do think that is so important, especially at least an hour of deep sleep and at least an hour and a half of REM and at least a seven hours of total sleep. Yeah, gosh, I love talking about this because I am uh, I love sleep and I I think that's one thing I do well. <laughs> I think routine is so key because our body gets in these rhythms and even subconsciously, if for me, I take an Epsom salt bath in the evening and actually heating up the body so it can cool down. There's a temperature association with good sleep. So mm -hmm. I think the optimal temperature is below 68 degrees in your home for optimal sleep. I think even lower than that might be optimal for our bodies, according to the study in the 60s, somewhere is the optimal. But our body, if we heat, if we take a hot shower or a hot bath, it actually it tends to allow us to cool down afterwards. It stimulates those thermal regulation system and having the body cool down. So basically morning we wake up, the cortisol rises and we get that bright light exposure. And that actually will help you sleep at night. So I, within five minutes of waking up, either go get the sunshine, water my flowers, or I go, I have a bright light system. So on the dark days of winter, I turn on that bright light because that bright light in our retina before our coffee actually stimulates the rise of um, cortisol, which of course helps. And then our body temperature goes up and telling us it's time for waking up. Then at night we want our body temperature to lower and want no blue lights. Like you said, all screens have blue lights. So you can get now apps and things to convert right. that. Or you can get blue blockers where you wear that. Um, and then I found uh, my uh, deep sleep is best between, um, you know, whenever I go to bed, 9, 10, 11, and uh, midnight or one. And my REM is always best from like 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. So if I skimp on the sleep either way, I will see it impinge on my deep at early hours and my REM. Um, PMF, I really like for the deep sleep. I try that, that low level, like Schumann frequency, seven or eight Hertz. And I feel like that's a yep. really good thing for, and I'd love to ask you, what are the things? Cause we talked about all these really basics, which is where you start, but red light and PEMF and some of these other electromagnetic frequencies and things. Have you found any evidence-based usage of these with cognition or lasers, or what are the top two or three or four things that you think really have promise um, as far as wow. modalities? Yeah, it's a great point. And, you know, I, I've been mainly interested in, you know, what are the mechanisms? How, what does this drive? And we're now, you know, by the way, trying to make now adapt these for ALS and adapt them for frontal temporal dementia. Can we use the same principles, but understanding that each of these has its own unique biochemistry and genetics? So I think that, you know, the future for all of us is to be able to prevent and reverse all of these different neurodegenerative diseases, especially the earlier, the better. And part of that has come out is some form of stimulation. Now, what is best? I tend to like the red light because it actually, there's a lot of data on it and there's a lot of, uh, you know, it actually has the appropriate wavelength, mm -hmm. for example, for cytochrome C, for stimulation. So I like that approach. Um, interestingly, as you know, 40 Hertz has come back again and again and again on all the studies as being for some reason, whether it's 40 Hertz sound or 40 Hertz light, whatever it is, light stimulation. And then of course, MERT. Uh, and Dr. Gerilyn Brosfield has done a really nice job with her looking uh, looking at MERT with her patients. Uh, so a magnetic form of stimulation. There's of course microcurrent. Um, there are now you know sound experiments. I tend to like the, the you know the the light the, the photobiomodulation just because there are more data I think on this right now than others. But all of these represent some form of stimulation. And again, you know, you if you're going to work out with weights, you better have good nutrition. So you want to have all the other things working and yeah. then to have this mild stimulation. You don't want to overdo it because you don't want to crash the system. But appropriate stimulation does seem to be very helpful time after time. 
I love how you frame that because I think it is so important. People get all these bells and whistles on expensive devices and the companies are trying to sell us, even as physicians, right? They're trying to get us to buy the next $20,000 device for our patients. And it's, yeah. it's really not, those things can be helpful. Yes. But it absolutely has to start with the foundational step that we first talked about. Um, so this would be a good time to talk about diet. We haven't talked about diet yet. And I know you have an incredible new um, program that you're releasing soon. I want to hear about that. I want you to share, but tell us about diet first, as far as what are people looking for if they have cognitive impairment? Um, where do you start with diet? Such a good point. Yeah. So, you know, and I, I am not a nutritionist, so I'm sure I know far less about this than, than most people listening. I'm simply interested in what is the neurochemistry that makes your synapses function? Because this is loss of functional synapses when you are developing cognitive decline. So it turns out that you have to have all the things we've been talking about. You have to have the appropriate energetics. You have to have the appropriate uh, trophic factors. I was really surprised to see beautiful work coming out of Emory looking at the biology of BDNF versus the biology of APP. And these things are just intimately related. They have similar proteases that are involved with these things. It's amazing. So this is part of your normal neuroplastic chemistry. Uh, and so all of these things are, you know, are working together um, when you're actually trying to make people do better. So the common thing, as you know, people will say, okay, Dr. Jill, this is great, but it's just too complicated. It's hard for me. I don't know where to go. I don't know what to buy. Um, and, you know, this is why we put out the second book to try to be more specific, but then people said, I just, it's too much. So one of the most common things is, can you just give me something that does the right thing to, to help me out? And yes, you have to hit several things. You have to hit the ability to be metabolically flexible. So you got to be able to make glucose and make ketones. You got to get that plant rich, mildly ketogenic, high fiber, you know, good microbiome, heal the gut, all these things, you know, heal the gut and heal the blood brain barrier. These are all coming together. And so the, you, what works best is a plant rich. And there are lots of ways that people have done this. But what has worked best is a plant-rich, mildly ketogenic diet with appropriate periods of fasting. Now, you have to be careful. People are often frail. You don't want to fast them too long, but you don't want to have no fast either. So you want to have some time for autophagy. You want to have some time for your uh, appropriate cleansing of the brain uh, you know, with your glymphatics. So you want to do all these things that are appropriate. And so uh, actually, Julie G, who is a APOE 44 patient who's done very, very well for over 10 years now uh, and been a real activist and citizen scientist, she and, and actually my wife, uh, Dr. Aida Lachine, uh, got together and worked with Nutrition for Longevity. This was the company founded uh, by uh, Walter, Dr. Walter Longo and also Jennifer Maynard um, and spent months and months and months getting, okay, how can you deliver to people, make it really easy boom, you bring in meals for, it's typically for Monday through Friday. Uh, and how can you do that to make it really easy and to make it appropriately organic and appropriately uh, pastured and appropriately wild caught fish and all the things that make it so that you hit all the, the right places for your synapses. And so they now have this and it's uh, it's under KetoFlex. So if you just look at K-E-T-O-F-L-E-X 123.com, KetoFlex.com, KetoFlex123. Uh, because it's a KetoFlex 12-3 approach. Now, the, as you know, there are other diets that people have used, um, but they don't tend to get you, they, they don't hit some of the biochemical parameters. They don't get you into ketosis at the appropriate time. Some of them don't have enough of the appropriate nutrients. So this is the one that actually biochemically works the best for cognition. And there are many people who've been using it uh, who are you know living proof. And I'd say, I'd start with Julie, who's been doing this sort of thing for many, many years. So yes, please check it out. I've, I've, I've eaten them myself and they definitely improved my ketosis. Um, they definitely are very, very helpful. And I give credit to Nutrition for Longevity for making them delicious. Oh, this is amazing because it's one of the most practical things that people, even my patients that maybe aren't cognitively impaired, have trouble with. What do we eat? How do we eat well? And it's, I think it's more and more complex. And what right. I love about the program, and I've been a fan of this for dec almost a decade now, I don't know how long it's been, but the plants are so crucial. And sometimes you hear keto and people are just eating bacon and butter, you know, and it's like, <laughs> wait, no, 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 right? And you and I totally agree on this, but I, I think that's so crucial for people to know you can be ketogenic or, or mildly ketogenic, as you put it and still have 
plant-based diet. And there's like this, this uh, really, really important place where they meet. And I really feel like this is the foundation. If you've had cancer, of course, the cognition, but this place where you're getting fibrous, uh, uh, nutrient dense foods, but also um, metabolic flexibility is really where we're landing on for not only cognition, but many other diseases. Absolutely. You know, and you mentioned earlier, we were talking about the uh, the uh, nature of the of the innate immune system and where the memory is. So what happens is you can become hyperactive. Interestingly, and it fits beautifully with this. If you eat saturated fats, you go up like this. And so now you are in a more pro-inflammatory state. And on the other hand, if you're eating omega-3s, you're coming down. Interestingly, if you have adverse childhood experiences, you're going back up. So anything that's causing stress is resetting that system to this more pro-inflammatory state. And we discovered in the lab and published almost a decade ago now, that APOE4 does that itself. So you've got to essentially counter that with appropriate things like omega-3s and things like, and, and curcumin and appropriate things like that. And speaking of curcumin, I should ask you, have you seen this stuff recently on curcumin being adulterated with lead chromate because of the yellow color? Oh, you know, I it's have. Just, yes, yes. <laughs> Which is, is scary. scary for sports. It is like some of these things are like, oh, goodness, we're get, trying to get the, even like um, kale and these wonderful leafy greens are used to pull thallium from the soil. So now oh. some of these green juices, if you're not careful for a source and it can be organic as has this loads of cadmium and thallium. And you're right. It really is scary of what we're um, last little thing to, before I let you go, APOE4, this is a big fear thing for people who have it or know they have it. Maybe if you're listening out there, you don't even know, um, what's the prognosis for apoe 4 4s and basically tell us what it is. And then what would you do differently for them? And what would their risk be for cognitive decline? Yeah, great point. And you know, things are changing dramatically because you can now check someone's uh, PTAL 181. Everyone should know that. You can check their AA beta 42 40 ratio and soon GFAP. So here's the thing if you have no copies of APOE4, and that's three quarters of the population, most being three threes, some two threes, your lifetime risk for Alzheimer's is about 9%. It's not zero, but it's not too high. If you have a single copy, and that's 75 million Americans, and everybody should know it, yeah. your risk is 30%. Please get on some prevention. You don't have to get this. The biggest message for today is Alzheimer's is now optional. Nobody needs to get this problem. So that's 75 million Americans. Please find out. Please get on active prevention. There are lots of you know great things to do. If you have two copies, and that's about 7 million Americans, unfortunately, the vast majority don't know it. Your risk is up more like 70%. Most likely you will develop Alzheimer's disease. And so again, you don't have to. Please get on active prevention. Now, what does that mean? That means get a cognoscopy, get on the personalized part. As Dr. Jill was mentioning earlier, this is all about personalized medicine. That is the future and that's the present now as well. But yes, you start with the basics, the diet, exercise, sleep, stress, all the things we've been talking about. And most people are going to do just fine with that. But find out if you have chronic infection that's undiagnosed, you can get that treated. I mean, again, you know, Lyme disease, such a common issue. So many people have it, don't realize. Of course, long COVID is now emerging as a big issue yes. for people's cognition for the future. Find out if you've got exposure in your home to mycotoxins, find out. Even if you're not having symptoms yet, you are at risk for symptoms down the road get on an appropriate diet do a month, do a a week or two uh, of of uh, of ketoflex 123 uh, through n4l or one of these groups it's it's a good idea get yourself in an optimal state uh, performance is closely related to risk yeah. so you get yourself in an optimal state do these sorts of things and you'll can you can lower your risk dramatically we haven't seen a single person yet and i ask all the doctors i talk to have you ever seen anyone who started when they were asymptomatic, did the right things for prevention and still developed dementia. I haven't seen one yet. I haven't heard of one yet. Um, there will be some at some down the road, but at least what, what you can say is it's, it's very uncommon. Yeah. Uh, tremendous. Thank you for the tireless efforts and work that you bring to the world, Dr. Bredesen. You are just a gift to humanity and a gift to so many, including myself as a, as a fellow doctor that, that looks to you for guidance and wisdom and research. And we are so grateful, both the patients and the doctors. Let's just leave everybody with where they can find you and repeat the KetoFlex and then your own recode. Where can people find more information about this? 
Yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And thank you, Dr. Jill, for all the great stuff you've been doing. Of course, I'm always hearing about wonderful, wonderful patient stories of people who've come to you and had such dramatic improvements. So thank you for all your great work over the years. And of course, your education and teaching for all of us. Uh, so where people can find uh, Facebook, uh, Dr. Dale Bredesen, uh, you know, also on Twitter, also uh, on Instagram. Uh, and then we, please be aware of the new randomized controlled trial. Um, you can see Evanthea Dementia Reversal Trial. Evanthea is E-V-A-N-T-H-E-A. Um, that actually came from the mother uh, of of our uh, of our the donor who supported this work. Very very kind doctor, uh, uh, or very kind to support the doctors Diana Mary, and we're grateful to her. Uh, and so please please check that out, especially if you're in uh, one of those six uh, areas that I mentioned before. Um, and so uh, please uh, take a look at this. And again, um, uh, get a cognoscopy. You can look at mycognoscopy.com. You can also look at KetoFlex, K-E-T-O-F-L-E-X, 123.com uh, for the meal deliveries. Easy, delicious, great stuff to have. Perfect. And wherever you're listening, I am putting these websites in. You'll be able to see them and link to them. Um, so if you didn't get that down, just come back to the landing page. You'll go, we'll put all the links in. Dr. Bredesen, thank you so much. So appreciative for all your work. Thank you, Dr. Jill. Thanks. Great talking to you as always. You too.